Thanks very much. Delighted to be with you today, and thanks for, thanks for attending the session. The last time I was here doing a sort of economic update, the big question in that presentation had to do with whether the third lane of our economy would open. I used an analogy of a congested expressway like 66 when I was coming in yesterday that is capable of producing a lot more traffic and movement of people than is the case when it's really slow. We were growing, the economy when I was here last year was growing at a rate of a little better than 2%, and the question was, will we get to 3%, the third lane? The data that we examined said, yes, it's coming. It was optimistic. The third lane is going to open, and sure enough, it did. As the year progressed, I'm speaking of 2014, as 2014 progressed, when we got to the second quarter, GDP growth broke 5%, you know, one of the largest numbers we've seen in a while. The next quarter broke 5.5. Gosh, this was beginning to feel like the yellow brick road. We were really moving along. Then GDP growth in the fourth quarter dropped to 2.2 sort of familiar territory. Uh, we were back, in a sense, on a two-lane highway, having experienced pretty high speed with reasons to be optimistic. Then data for the economy sort of turned and began to look very weak. There were a number of reasons for that. One was monetary. Our friends in Europe began to print money at a rapid pace, doing what we had done a couple or three years earlier. So they went to quantitative easing. And if somebody else, someone other, some other country prints money faster than you do, their money will fall in value relative to yours. And so the dollar became unusually strong. The strong dollar then reduced our export sales. And we got a little bit of a sock there. The price of oil and energy began to decline. And that's good if you're a consumer. It's tough when you are a producer, and so some of the producing regions of the U.S. that had been incredibly strong began to weaken. And so then when we got the first quarter's data from the Department of Commerce on GDP growth, the number came in at 0.2% growth. And the scuttlebutt right now that, that we hear in terms of the next estimate, we get three estimates, the last one is the final, is that that estimate will be reduced. So it's highly likely that we will have negative GDP growth in the first quarter. Then there's a the question, well, how are we doing right now? The Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta produces a GDP growth data index called GDP Now. They produce it every week. I expect if you scratched around a little bit, you would find that they produce it every day. And the most recent number this morning was 0.7 right now. Well, that's a whole lot better than 0.2 and a whole lot better than negative. And the forecast for the second quarter, the consensus forecast for the second quarter is 2.2. In other words, things look a little bit better, but we've sort of fallen on a bumpy road. In a sense, uh, like that wonderful movie or book, The Wizard of Oz, we were on the yellow brick road and it felt so good, and then while we were cheering, lo and behold, you might remember, the wicked witch of the West shows up and scares hell out of us and gets us off the yellow brick road for a while and then we're hoping that we can get back. And so as we think about these things, then in our conversation today, the title, which is probably the better part of the conversation, Bootleggers and Baptists in the Garden of Good and Evil, and a focus on understanding America's entangled economy. Now the background to this slide uh, comes from the cover of a book that was written in 1994, John Berendt's Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. You may have read it, it was a bestseller. Turned out 
turned into a movie. Clint Eastwood produced the movie, and the movie was also uh, a ringer. Uh, it's a beautiful sight if you like cemeteries, as I do. Uh, that cemetery is at Savannah, Georgia. Um, and the cemetery is the Bonaventure Cemetery. Coastal cemeteries are always interesting to me because, particularly when they are three or four hundred years old, because you get all kinds of history written on tombstones. And this little piece of sculpture, called the Bird Girl, is there in the garden as we talk about the garden of good and evil. But let's just take this title one piece at a time, starting with the last piece. The slowdown that we are having in our economy is difficult to understand. At least that's what we see when we read the blogs of Ben Bernanke as a leading thinker about these kinds of things, Larry Summers, another, as they exchange ideas, Alan Blender in the Wall Street Journal talking about this slowdown, saying it's kind of hard to figure out. I think a piece of it, and there's some pretty interesting work that has been done, particularly by Casey Mulligan at the University of Chicago, a piece of the explanation has to do with the entanglement of regulation in our economy. And that entanglement has become rather severe severe in the last two decades, high growth. By analogy, I am showing you kudzu. And uh, those of you who live in this part of the world are very familiar with sites like that. Kudzu dies down in the wintertime, but it always comes back. It's a rapidly growing piece of vegetation that was introduced to the United States by the U.S. Department of Agriculture in the 1930s. The tuber itself originates from Japan and China, and it had a wonderful characteristic, and the reason it was introduced uh, at that time, uh, kudzu, is because of this. That's a picture of a North Carolina farm a hundred years ago. We had serious soil erosion problems. Topsoil was being washed away. Throughout the southeast, where cotton had been the principal crop produced, and that was the problem. And so a program was introduced by the U.S. Department of Agriculture to encourage farmers to plant kudzu. And the encouragement was to pay them $8 an acre to plant it. I can remember when my grandfather planted kudzu in his field so that he could eliminate that problem. 1.2 million acres were planted in kudzu under the USDA program, and we got rid of this, and that land could not be plowed, and we got that. <laughs> that land cannot be plowed. <laughs> and so what was viewed as a solution, and it was at the margin, in the right amount, became a new problem. And the problem became so severe that the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the first thing they did was to cut out the subsidy we'll no longer pay you to plant this stuff. Then it was declared to be invasive or a pest, and now we'll support you in killing this stuff. <laughs> so we have sort of regulatory reform going on in the kudzu entangled economy. And so that's, that's sort of the analogy there. We'll talk about it some more. But as a result of this entangled economy, I'm arguing we're getting slow growth and it's slow growth that cannot be predicted well. What I'm showing you here are forecasts for the Federal Open Market Committee of the U.S. Federal Reserve. And the colors are fairly vivid, but that high line that you see up at the top there was a forecast that was made in June of 2010 for U.S. GDP growth. The dashed line is actual. Then the next line is for November 2011, getting closer. Then the next one is December 2012, getting convergence. And finally the forecast begins to get weak enough that it begins to converge on actual data. Now these are some of the brightest and best people in the profession who are building a forecast with incredible resources available to them. And so now the conversation 
is about secular stagnation. The question is, has our economy entered into a phase that is called secular stagnation? That's a term of art that entered the vocabulary in 1938 by Alvin Hansen, the leading Keynesian economist in the United States at that time, in a speech that he gave to the American Economic Association. And he said there are times when because of deeply rooted actions in our economy that economic activity stagnates for a period of time. And so now as we look at this forecast, there's conversation that say, wow, our economy has stagnated and we couldn't figure it out, but now we're about to get there. Now I'm going to show you another series of forecasts. This is for the Congressional Budget Office. Their forecast for interest rates for our economy. And the line that is sort of greenish blue, it just runs right along the zero horizontal axis. That's the actual interest rate. And the lines that you see, they were forecasting 4.7%, then 4.4%, then 4 now 3.4%. And the interest rate that we're talking about on three months treasuries is still zero. Again, these are some of the brightest and best people. Using models that are based largely on Keynesian thinking, that's sort of the basis of most of the models that are out there, using those models, and we can't forecast is what this says. It says, hey, we understand it's hard. Do we have an economy that is somehow, it has something unspecified that has slowed it down, or is it an entangled economy where you have regulation now at every margin of decision making, and so when you try monetary policy or when you try fiscal policy, the PlayStation doesn't seem to work anymore. You push the buttons and you say, when I push this button over here, interest rates should rise. Well, they didn't. Well, I'm going to push this button over here called monetary policy. I'm pushing the button and I'm looking and nothing happens. And so my argument is you're pushing the buttons for an entangled economy. So, so let's go forward here. We got this data on May the 6th. Um, what was that? Week before last. On May the 6th, the Bureau of Labor Statistics came out on it with a report on the growth of productivity in our economy. They gave estimates for the most recent decade, estimates for the previous decade, and they went further back with respect to productivity growth. And what you're seeing here is a chart that was produced by the Progressive Policy Institute showing the results. The they're showing compensation, that's the red line. The blue line is productivity growth. If you'll notice, it peaks up there in the first quarter of 2005. That's the most recent peak. Then it drops. Our economy right now is operating at 1.4. That's growth in productivity. Then if you ask the question, how much would you forecast wages to grow in our economy? You would say, well, they can't grow more than 1.4 because that's all of the growth and productivity that we have. Well, you can't pay all of the growth in wages, and so the red line there shows what has happened to wages in our economy. If you stared at this for a while, you would see that wage earners are getting a larger part of the growth in productivity than has been the case in the past. But again, is this secular stagnation? Or is this an entangled economy? And the chief economist there, the president there of Progressive uh, Policy Institute, on looking at this data said, it is time for us to have growth policy in the United States if we ever expect wages to grow at any meaningful level. When we have times like this, going back to the Wizard of Oz, there's always a tendency for us to say, oh, if there were just a wizard. You know, if we could just get the right person with the PlayStation, with the hands on the levers, if we could just get the right wizard, then we could get back on the yellow brick road. And heaven knows we might even find our way back to Kansas 
That is to pre-Great Recession prosperity. If we could just get a wizard. And so there's a tendency to look for the wizard. That the way the wizard looked in that wonderful movie, you might remember. But sometimes when we're looking for a wizard, we're looking for someone like this. Alan Greenspan was referred to respectfully as the maestro. The maestro who could direct the economic orchestra and we would get beautiful harmony as long as the maestro had his magic. But the magic sort of disappeared. And so now the current hope to some extent is that the chairperson of the Fed, Janet Yellen, would become a wizard. That somehow she would have the gifts and the wisdom and the magic to get our economy back on its feet. And I expect if you were to ask her about this, she would be the first person to say, I'm not a wizard. You've got to look for some other remedy to your problem. And I would suggest she's probably, she, to, in my book, is one of the best qualified people we have had in that job in a long, long time. An excellent woman, but not a wizard. In other words, the wizardy idea just doesn't work out real well when we look at the day. <coughs> at the data. And so we're back to the kudzu problem. And now we want to go into the other elements of the title. The title has bootleggers and Baptists there in the garden of good and evil. We want to ask, well, what do you mean by good and evil? And then let's talk a little bit more about this entangled economy and sort of how it got that way. What do we mean by bootleggers and Baptists? Uh, that is not much of a puzzle for people who are from this region of the United States or I would say from any rural region of the United States. Both bootleggers and Baptists love laws that close the liquor stores on Sunday. That's the beginning of the theory. But for very different reasons. The Baptists think the world will be a better place if there's a diminution in the consumption of alcoholic beverages and so let's just have at least one day a week when they're not selling demon rum down on Main Street. <laughs> the bootleggers say, gosh, what a wonderful idea. I would love to eliminate competition one day a week. I can buy my booze on Saturday, which they do, and I'll sell it on Sunday with a premium because of the risk involved and also because of the lack of competition. And so you have two groups, two interest groups with totally different motivations who want the same law, which is wonderful for a politician. It's just wonderful for a politician. How could you ask for anything better than that? And so when the laws are up for reauthorization, the bootleggers never go down with a plaque saying, help your local bootlegger make a dishonest living. They don't ever do that. You will never see the bootleggers out in public holding forums or meeting here in the Rabin House office building as a group to brief their legislators. They never do that. The Baptists do it for them. I'm a Methodist. The Methodists do it for them. And so the Baptists pursue the goal, make certain that the enforcement is good, they watch, and the bootlegger reaps appropriable rents, which is to say they put money in the bank. And the Baptists get presumably what they want. That's the theory. The, and so here's a picture of the theory in terms of prohibition. There were two groups who wanted prohibition to continue. One represented by the person holding the Holy Bible, saying, Prohibition forever. And the other, the rum runners, who, as you may remember, lined up their rum running ships just outside the territorial waters of the United States with the ships tied to each other so that then high speed boats could go out and get their booze outside of the control of the revenuers during the Prohibition period, and they made huge amounts of money out of this, those two groups. So we have unvarnished special interest groups with different motivations. Both want the same thing. That's the kernel of the theory. But now what do we mean by the garden of good and evil? There's a picture of it. All right. That's a picture of our 
legislative chamber, but we could put a picture of any legislative chamber for any democracy in the world, and I would call it a garden of good and evil. This is a location where good things can happen. By deliberation, funds can go into areas of supporting public health, reducing contagious diseases, building infrastructure, improving highways and docks, providing protection to life, to limb, security to the country. I would call all those things good things. Or they can go into producing things that I would call evil. World War II killed 20 million people. I would call that evil. Other people might say, yeah, but what's your, what, was this, what other solution would you come up with? I don't know. But legislative bodies can act in ways that can be very destructive of human life, very destructive of freedom, and I would call that evil. But they can do good. All I'm saying is we have always have a collective choice problem when we make collective choices. That is when special interest groups begin to have an influence. That's the picture. It's not a condemnation of our system or any other democracy. It's a statement about the realities of collective choice. And so there's the garden of good and evil. And here the bootlegger Baptist, a little bit more on the theory now. The bootlegger Baptist theory ties together interest groups which are like an engine to a car. The bootlegger Baptist theory is a transmission theory. How do you transmit back to the politician the desires of people who want things done? that will make their lives better as they view them. The politician always has a severe problem of knowing what it is precisely that people want. What is it? In my brief experiences in visiting with senators and congressmen, they always ask the first question after shaking hands, what can I do for you? And it's a wonderful question. They want to know. And once they find out what they can do for us, then the next problem is how in the world can I make that happen and how can I justify it to the world if what you really want is a special benefit to you and your people just in your district or just in your industry? Do you really want me to get up on the Senate floor and say, I want to introduce a bill that supports people named Yandel? I can't do that. You've got to help me. And so the Baptist part of the theory then gives a public interest tone that's very important. So the broker has a transfer knowledge problem and then a justification problem, and that's why the theory seems to be helpful to us in understanding. Now we're on our way to entanglement. When we look at the U.S. regulatory state and study it for a while, you will find that we have a particular way of regulating in the United States. When you wish to regulate, when you wish to alter human behavior in marketplaces, there are at least four ways to do that. You can go with property rights and common law that protect people from being harmed in ways against their will. Common law courts then enforce contracts. Common law courts then reward people who are damaged by someone else's action, and that disciplines behavior. That's one way. It's the oldest way we have in our history. You can put a tax on things you don't want to have happen. You can put a fee on things that you don't want to have happen. And you can raise the tax. And we've had a debate for 40 years in the United States, first about having a sulfur dioxide tax and then about having a carbon tax. So we've been talking about it for 40 years. We don't have one yet, and maybe we've got a reason why. Or you can say we will just set a performance standard. We want you to reduce your emissions by 25% from the current level, and we don't care how you do it. But if you don't do it, you will be penalized severely. That's called a performance standard. Or, finally, we can say, we are going to write a rule that is going to tell you exactly, exactly how you must construct your plant 
or exactly what kind of health care insurance you must provide to your employees, or exactly the words that you will be able to print on the labels of over-the-counter medicines where you are describing the benefits of the product. In other words, we can go with command and control regulation, which is what we tend to do in the United States. We are a command and control regulatory state. And so there's a question of why, why is that dominant? Why command and control? And there are two explanations for that. There may be more, but there are two that I will share with you. Here's part of the first one. In an economy, a society, where the funds available to the politician to spend on discretionary items are flat and not growing, I'm showing you the real value of funds as spent by the federal government the discretionary portion is at the bottom, and you'll notice there's no growth there. Well, it's out of that bucket that a politician might be able to dip if we were to say, well, just send us some funding, or just give us a tax increase or decrease. And there's not much to dip out of there because of the high growth in mandatory spending. And so when there are two ways to provide benefits to your constituents and to consumers, one is through fiscal actions and the other is through regulatory actions, when at the margin it becomes more costly to do things fiscally, you can do things with regulation. It would be possible to fund health care, for example, or you could say, we're just going to write a rule that requires you to buy it, All right. and we're going to tell you what to buy. We'll do it with command and control regulation. And that will not impact our budget by as much. Part of it will be subsidized, but most of it will not be. So with regulation, you can accomplish something. The second reason is that you can target benefits with regulation. And it's really hard to target benefits if you're using the other means. Well, here are, to, just to illustrate this, I, I got these out of, to, out of the, today's The Hill. There's a big debate right now of uh, regulation that is coming out of EPA that goes under the broad title of Waters of the United States. Uh, hearings have been being held, as you know. It's a very controversial discussion. Always is, this kind of thing. But in the article here at the very end, in the Senate, opponents are focusing on a bill that would repeal the rule and give EPA specific instructions and a deadline to rewrite it in a way that protects farmers and ranchers from regulation. And so if you go with command and control, you can write a statute or you can and you can instruct the regulatory agencies to write rules that exclude certain groups and target the outcome and you can also limit your use of scarce discretionary funds. Well, that was one that was in today's paper. I've got another one here. Oh, this is it. Democratic presidential front runner Hillary Clinton called for regulatory relief for community banks. I don't have to read any further. That's the point for community banks, and then she states reasons for that. With regulation, you can target. You can make friends and influence people. You can define winners and losers. You can help to cartelize an industry so they can raise their prices. You can do all kinds of things with regulations, and then if you devise it and develop it very carefully, you will get, quote, Baptist support for the rule that the bootleggers love, that the community bankers love. They would be the bootleggers in that little vignette, or that the ranchers and farmers love. They would be the bootleggers who would be gaining wealth by way of specified regulatory relief, bootleggers and Baptists. Now, to give you an example of bootleggers and Baptists, uh, this one comes from Nashville, Tennessee, 
uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, and all of the metropolitan areas of Tennessee, there have been referenda over the last few years having to do with legalizing the sale of wine in grocery stores. In Tennessee, up until this action, it was illegal throughout the state for a grocery store to sell wine. It wasn't illegal to sell wine, it's just that grocery stores could not sell wine. And so here's a referendum that's taking place. This was the television coverage there in Nashville, and there were two groups on the program on Channel 6. One was a Baptist preacher who says, we don't see that alcohol is bringing a lot to the table, benefiting our culture. In other words, they were opposed to allowing grocery stores to sell wine. The other group that was opposed were the liquor stores. They are already selling wine. And basically they're saying, we don't want any new competition. If you open up the market, it's going to hurt us. And so here you had the happy coincidence of liquor store operators and Baptist preachers publicly arguing for the same thing. Well, out in uh, Colorado in 2014, uh, and the rule was finally adopted, the very first rule in the United States by a state limiting methane emissions. This is in the production of gas and oil. And so, as the story tells us, there were two groups who were lobbying for this. Three of Colorado's biggest oil and gas companies and a national environmental group were lobbying, and they lobbied successfully. Who was it that was opposed to it? The little bitty operators who were a part of a trade association. But they lost. The big guys won, and the environmental community won. An example of bootleggers and Baptists. This, there's, a, there's a big a boom going on, and perhaps you are aware of it uh, one way or another, and that is electronic cigarettes. E-cigarettes are very controversial, particularly in the United States, more so here than in the United Kingdom. For example, the major health authorities in the United Kingdom say, hey, this is a pretty good idea. There are a lot of people who would like to kick the habit of smoking regular cigarettes. And e-cigarettes, so far as we can tell, are not harmful. They're not as harmful as the others. And so this is an avenue out of an addiction to smoking. It might become an addiction to vaping, which they say is not as harmful. And so there are now in the United States two groups lobbying mightily to put particular regulations on e-cigarettes. One group are the big three tobacco companies. The other group is made up primarily of health care advocates. And so we have the bootleggers and Baptists. Most likely, well, there's one other group, and it's an interesting group. Uh, something happened about a little less than 20 years ago, a major settlement was negotiated by the attorneys, generals of the attorneys General of the United States, what is called a multi-state settlement with the tobacco companies, which set up a funding to states from the major tobacco producers in order to reimburse the states for their Medicare expenditures associated with people who suffer because of their past smoking activities. That was the settlement. The settlement was for about $300 billion that was to be paid annually to every state in the United States. The funds were ideally to be used for smoking cessation programs. I hate to be the one to tell you that about 10% of those funds have been used for that purpose. But they had an interesting idea. Some state governors said, wow, wouldn't it be neat if we sold bonds for the future cash flow that will be coming to us forever from the tobacco companies? Then we could securitize this cash flow, and I, the governor now, would get to spend it all. The present value of all of those funds. And so a number of states issued tobacco bonds. They are revenue bonds. That's what they are called, revenue bonds, because it's a source of revenue that will fund the bonds. And so now, what do you think happens when e-cigarettes come along 
they are taking away market share from the regular cigarettes, reducing the revenue that comes in that can be going, and now you can see immediately another interest group that would say, we need to do something about e-cigarettes. In particular, we think they should become a part of the multi-state agreement so that they also would contribute funds the way the regular tobacco companies contribute. So it's just another story about regulations and the entanglement of an economy. One that's sort of interesting because there's so much discussion now of fracting, which of course has given the United States sort of an edge in oil and natural gas production, making us number one in the world in natural gas and maybe number one in the world in terms of crude oil with hydraulic fracturing. And there's one person who really is opposed to this. There are a lot of them who are really opposed to it, but this is someone on a big stage, and that's Mr. Putin. Mr. Putin has been advocating for the environmental community, saying hydraulic fracking can lead to bad things. As he said here in a speech in London, you can turn on your water faucet and bad stuff will ooze out of it. And so Mr. Putin has been lobbying European countries for several years now trying to get legislation passed making it illegal in those countries to do hydraulic fracking. Now they do hydraulic fracking in Russia, big time. But, uh, you know, Mr. Putin is saying, but it's bad and I'm going to try to protect the rest of you from doing these things. And we can see, well, obviously why. He wants to keep the market to himself and to his producers. It's just a purely competitive kind of thing. But the thing that has gotten really interesting is that the Russians are now funding environmental groups. The Russians are funding Baptist environmental groups to take up the cause for them. So now you have one of the world's largest producers of natural gas and petroleum products providing funds to some of the world's largest environmental groups, and we have an interesting kind of bootlegger Baptist phenomenon asking for rules that will restrict fracting. Bootlegger subsidizing Baptist, just some other examples, uh, the central, the middle one there, uh, Chesapeake Gas and the American Gas Association gave $26 million to the Sierra Club. In 2007, Sierra Club is working to bring down the use of coal in the production of energy. The people who produce natural gas would just love that. Any bootlegger would like to see the liquor stores closed on Sunday, and producers of natural gas would love to see the coal producers shut down, and so they funded Sierra Club to do their battle for them because Sierra Club believes in the same thing. Now the last one is an interesting one. It was a movie. Maybe you saw it. Promised Land. Full length movie. Well done. And it was funded by the United Arab Emirates. Promised Land was another movie telling about the evils of hydraulic fracturing. So we're looking at examples of the production of rules that have targeted benefits, differential effects, command and control, generally speaking, that are desired by two distinctly different groups. A little bit of data, what we're talking about here, uh, a proxy for it is a number of pages of new rules in the Federal Register, which is what you're seeing here. And if you notice, the high growth begins in 1970 under the leadership of America's environmental president, Richard Nixon. It was President Nixon who pushed for and enabled the creation of the EPA, who pushed for and enabled the creation of the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, who pushed for and enabled the creation of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Mr. Nixon was the environmental president, and you can see the boom in regulation that occurs there in the middle of the chart, that's the 1970s. But if we divide those numbers by GDP, then you can really see the boom. 
And this, just, this is just saying, in a bigger economy, maybe it takes more rules. And so let's weight it by GDP and see what the picture turns out to be. And there we can see the huge growth that takes place. And what I'm describing here is the principal origin, the principal origin of entanglement that goes back to the 1970s. The rules are of particular kind. They are command and control. The proxy for that is shown in this chart. This is looking at budgetary cost of regulatory agencies, all of them, in terms of the kinds of rules that they produce. The blue, the darker blue, is for what is called social regulation or command and control. All right. The red is economic regulation, fees, taxes, other approaches. And what we're seeing here is the huge expansion of command and control, and I'm offering you perhaps a theory that throws a little bit of light that answers the question on why has the blue grown so much, and why has the red not grown much at all? We have two approaches for dealing with regulatory problems. And as we get entangled, of course, the entanglement is cumulative and some guys there at George Mason working at the Mercatus Center have developed an index of regulation and what they have done, they have looked at the entire code of federal regulation. If we stack those books up on the floor here, they would go almost to the ceiling. They've looked at that entire code. They have developed with other people a wonderful piece of software that counts the frequency of the occurrence of command and control words. And those words, shall, must, may not, prohibited, required. And now they have a piece of data by industry so that you can look to see which industries have been most affected by regulation and which less. And the dark blue line in this chart going back to 1997 coming forward to 2010, the dark blue line is the average for all industries in America in terms of the growth of command and control regulation, and it's about a 20% gain in command and control. Then the other lines are for different industries. You can see some industries have much less growth. Some have much more growth. Well, if we look at this for a minute, you might say, well, which industries are the winners? Which ones are the losers? And what I've been talking about sort of turns the answer on its head. In a bootlegger Baptist world, the winners are the ones who got a lot of regulation. In a kind of world where you think efficiency is the determining factor, the winners would be the industries that didn't get a lot of regulation. But the whole story I'm telling is one is that I'm building is one that says there are interest groups who want regulation. There are industry groups who want a particular kind of regulation. The community banks want a particular kind of regulation. John Deere petitioned the US EPA to increase the stringency of its air pollution standards for small gasoline engines. Why? They had just developed a new technology that made their engines cleaner than everybody else's. And so it was a way to raise competitors' costs. So it's that kind of play that we are talking about. This is just another measure of it, and you can see in this chart, it's the paper industry that has gotten the most regulation relative to three others in the chart. Just more of the same sto story. Now, let's see if we can tie the shoestrings into a boat. At the very beginning, my point was, in the garden of good and evil, when the bootleggers and the Baptists are working, it's possible for us to get an economy that is so tangled with the regulations that productivity begins to fall, or the number gets smaller. Now, Anthony Davies, working there at Mercatus, took this data that I just referred to on regulation, and said, okay, I'm going to divide it into two, I'm going to divide the sample into two sets. One, those industries that are the least regulated, and those that are the most regulated. 
Then I'm going to look at that Bureau of Labor Statistics data and see what is the relationship with respect to productivity gains. And here's his result. A huge difference. Those industries that got a lot of regulation, slow, slow growth in productivity relative to those industries that did not get so much. So let me stop right here and summarize and then make one last statement and see if you have questions. Do my best to speak to them. We've got an economy that keeps falling off of the yellow brick road. The yellow brick road is an economy that grows at 3.14% annually. That's the long-term average. And right now we're growing at 0.2. Maybe according to the Atlanta Fed, 0.1 or 0.7 with prospects for this second quarter being 2.2 or 2.3, some distance from 3.14, but with a good possibility that before this year is out, we'll again see some yellow brick road. But it's an economy that grows slowly. There's a big debate about that. In the big debate, there hasn't been a lot of attention paid to regulation in our entangled economy. I'm arguing that it's regulatory entanglement that is part of the problem that needs to be dealt with. And so then that gets us back to the kudzu. How do you get rid of kudzu? What do you do about the overplanting of kudzu? Well, the first thing that was done, as I told you, the USDA stopped subsidizing it. For about the last 15 years, the budgets of our regulatory agencies have grown at a faster pace than the budget of the United States government. That says we are subsidizing the growth of regulation. We borrow money, go into debt, and we're borrowing money at a faster clip to build more regulation than we are to operate the overall government. And so the subsidy could stop if Congress so deemed and said, look, here's a new rule. Regulatory agencies' budgets will grow no faster than the budget of the United States. Now live within your means and follow our bidding. The second possibility would be to do what the USDA did with kudzu and they declared it to be an invasive vegetable, invasive vegetation. Let's poison it. Now that says let's look at the regulation that is on the books and require a retrospective look. Mr. Obama has written an executive order to do exactly that. Let's take a retrospective look and then force a justification on old kudzu. And if it cannot be justified, cut it out. Every president in recent years has issued such an executive order. Not a lot of kudzu has been cut out, but it's a move in, I would suggest, the right direction. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thanks for being here. Thanks a heap. <laughs>